Thank you. So welcome everyone. It's been a long time in the preparations for this webinar, so we're absolutely delighted that you could join us this evening. So my name is Jane McNamara. I'm a therapeutic radiographer and a senior lecturer working at Sheffield Hallam University. And one half of my face, yeah, I think it's definitely that half, um, is Radcha. Um, I'll hand you over to my other half, not romantically, just professionally, just to make that very clear. Thanks. Uh, my name's Naman. I'm uh, working as a research radiographer. And I work as a clinical advisor, and yeah, one half of my face is also now on the screen in front of you. <laughs> Thank you. So for anyone who isn't aware of RadChat, uh, RadChat is a podcast channel um, and also social media channel aimed at oncology professionals, patients, and anyone training within health and social care to learn more about oncology. Um, we started over a year and a half ago, and as a consequence of starting this channel, we have as such won a couple of awards around patient care and also um, team of the year for the Society College of Radiographers. So we are absolutely delighted to be able to work with Leo Cancer Care this evening. Um, from a personal perspective, I'm very passionate about the work that Leo Cancer Care do, uh, largely because everything they do, they have the patient at the heart of, which is something that we're definitely passionate about here at RadChat. So I'm going to hand over to Kay and Gemma to just introduce themselves. So my name's Kate. I um, well, I now work for Leo. I joined Leo in March, but prior to that, I was a therapeutic radiographer. I still consider myself a therapeutic radiographer, um, and I specialised for the last many years in review radiotherapy. So I sort of did those one-to-one -one consultations with urology patients, head and neck patients, breast patients. So very patient orientated role, and that's where I sort of moved over to Leo to sort of provide that input in, into our work here. Thanks, Kate. I'm Gemma Nunn. I'm the Clinical Training Manager here at LEO covering the UK and Europe. Um, thanks so much for having us this evening. It's so exciting. Um, so again, like Kate, I'm also a therapeutic radiographer. I'm still registered. I've been with uh, LEO Cancer Care now for about 18 months. Um, during that time, oh my goodness, it's been uh, crazy. I've learned so much um, through testing to um, patient involvement still, research, um, obviously the training, um, human factors. And then when I was a therapeutic radiographer, I worked more recently as a band seven doing pre-treatment, um, but I'm also um, very up to date with treatment. And I had um, other skills like venipuncture and um, IV cannulation. So there was a lot of skills that between us we can we can bring into Leo. So it's really exciting to be here chatting with you tonight and sharing the world of Upright. Oh, thank you ever so much. So as always with any webinars, as you would imagine, we have got some housekeeping. So you shouldn't be able to turn your microphones on, but if you can, please don't. Um, it just might put the presenters off. Um, you do have the chat function, so by all means, please do utilise that to ask any questions. The questions won't be seen by other members of the audience, so you can feel reassured to ask absolutely anything. There is no silly question. Um, I fully appreciate that some students might be in the audience. Please don't feel like you can't ask um, anything at all that springs to mind, because actually it's really important um, from a general public perspective to see what questions people might ask. We do have an evaluation. Um, as with all webinars and um, education events, we really do appreciate feedback um, in being able to enhance the experience for future events. So please do take a, a, an image review of the QR code, and I will also share in the chat function as well a link to that evaluation. So before you leave, hopefully you'll get an opportunity to do that. Uh, we don't experience um, any technical difficulties usually, but you never know. So if for any reason you do experience anything, then by all means, please do leave and rejoin. There should be no issues with that. The waiting room will be in place. So you might be on hold in the waiting room for a few seconds, but we will endeavor to let you in. And just to remind you that the webinar is being recorded. And um, so if your face is on, on your camera, then you may be on the recording. 
So um, I will pass over to Kate and Gemma to be able to start our presentation for this evening. I have had the privilege of having a sneak peek um, and you're all in for a great presentation. Um, so over to you two and thank you again so much. Thanks guys. Right. Right, is everyone seeing that one okay? Give us yeah. a nod. Perfect. Right, we'll get started. So we've done our little introduction on, on who we are. So we'll dive straight into a little bit about the history of Upright. So we wanted to basically say that Upright Radiotherapy isn't a brand new concept. It's not something that Leo invented. It's something that was actually introduced. The first documented case was back in the 1950s. Um, unfortunately, diagnosis in, in the 1950s was quite late. So people were already quite symptomatic when they were diagnosed with their cancer. So they were in some places quite poorly. Um, side effects at that time as well were quite more severe than we have now. We've done a lot of research over these last decades, few decades, really at being great at sort of conforming our, our radiation and reducing the dose of the healthy tissue around that gives us side effects. But that's not what we were doing back then. And we had big, large square fields and that meant a lot of side effects. So people were quite poorly when they were having treatment. So it was actually more comfortable and convenient to treat people lying down. And we kind of stayed that way. Um, and historically imaging is, we know that imaging is so important for radiotherapy nowadays. We need to visualize our tumor when we, we want to treat it. And we haven't really been able to master upright imaging. So when you go to the hospital for your, your scans now, for your MRI, your CT scan, it's generally lying down. And it's only more recently that we've started to weave upright imaging into things. So that's made upright radiotherapy a possibility. So we're gonna introduce you to the technology now that's actually made upright a, a reality. Thanks Kate. So just before we dive straight in, um, there's just a few things we need to say, which is that currently um, what we're going to present to you in terms of the technology is not uh, currently commercially available. Um, so what you see here is what we're going through at the moment. And I just want to first introduce you to uh, our upright patient rotation system, affectionately known as EVE. And all of our technology um, and all of our products are actually named after trailblazing women in science. So bringing that history lesson forward to today, what you're looking at here is uh, that concept, but sort of reimagined and improved on. And the concept this time around started about five years ago um, in Australia where um, Stephen, our CEO, together with our VP of Engineering, were in Australia and they worked really closely um, with design engineers and with patients. And they looked at how can we position patients reproducibly and stably to be able to deliver radiotherapy. And that's really the core of what radiotherapy is, as a, certainly as a therapeutic radiographer, that's what I want to be able to achieve. So... To look at EVE, we tend to separate it out into the chair itself, which is anything above the floor. So anything that supports the patient posture. So there's a couple of things I'm gonna draw your attention to here. First of all, the seat angle or the seat pan itself. As you can see, um, this lady in the picture is almost what we call um, a perched position. You may have heard that if you've looked us up before. And the reason that this came about is if we had a patient at 90 degrees in a seat, like we're all sitting now, we wouldn't be able to treat a beam into lower pelvic organs uh, because it would catch through the upper thighs. But there's another secret to this. That perch position is being able to be maintained by patients because of the shin and the heel rest combination. So um, some of you may have had the opportunity at shows we've been at to test this out. Uh, we like to call it sort of a, a positive pressure when that shin rest comes towards you. And really this is what helps patients that maybe have reduced mobility or comorbidity 
to support them in this position. And it was also designed for many other indexing points for a mobilization. Another great thing um, that you'll see here as well is the backrest. Now we have a great partnership so far with um, Civco. This is a standard carbon fiber backrest by Civco. But as you may notice, it's half the thickness of a supine couch top. And it makes it incredibly light for us as therapeutic radiographers to move in and out. And we've been able to do this because the patient's weight is now more in the seat and not in the backrest. So there's some elements there of the chair. What you'll also see is that we can actually move the patient position up and down depending on the height of the patient. And we can also add immobilization devices, which I'll come into in a moment. So that's what you see above the floor. What you're seeing on the bottom there is what we like to call the base. Now this is your six degrees of freedom. So we rotate the patient around 360 degrees. We can move laterally, longitudinally and vertically. So really this is where the paradigm shift starts to come in. We're now rotating the patient and having a fixed beam. So instead of having that massive, large rotating gantry that weighs six to 10 tons rotating around the patient, that's now fixed and we're now rotating the patient instead. Also coming back to the floor there, we have three degrees of pitch and roll um, as well. So you've got everything that your sixth off can offer in a standard supine, but we've just converted it into upright. So that's a little introduction. And as you can see there, we've just got an accompanying little video. So you can see um, the patient positioning system in action. So you can see how it all works together. And it's got a very simple to use pendant, hand pendant, much like what you're used to using in, in clinical settings now. And the great thing about this is that the only thing that the therapeutic radiographer really has to do is change the angle of the backrest. So that can go from zero and it can tilt forwards and backwards 15 degrees. And so that is a manual movement and you can place your mobilization devices. All the other features are stored and saved. So the seat pan, the shin rest, the, back, um, the hill stop, all that positioning can be saved. So at the pre-treatment session. So when you come back to treatment, it's like an auto load function. It will move to that patient's position. So hopefully that will speed up the workflow for us as therapeutic radiographers and gives us a little bit less to think about. So moving on to mobilization, I've got three key elements that I want to talk about here. So as you can see, this is um, a vacuum cushion and uh, we're placing it onto the seat pan here. And you can see how it indexes so beautifully with the, the shape of the seat pan. So when we come as therapeutic red officers to place that onto the seat pan, it's pretty solid. There's no um, confusion about which way it goes or any sort of movement. It molds really beautifully onto there. And the second one here um, is the abdominal compression belt. Now, we actually have used this more as um, like a comfort or to remind people and to maintain their position. That's the feedback that we've received from um, people when we go to, to demo, but also from patients. So currently we've not tried it as compression, but it's just, I mean, I had someone explain it to me like a hug the other day. Um, it gives you that really sort of reaffirming comfort in the upright position. <laughs> And then here we have an example of a head and neck thermoplastic from a participant here. Um, so what you can see is that this is standardly available and mobilization that we're all familiar with using currently in the clinical setting. And what we've tried to simulate here is using um, optical guidance tracking. So obviously sometimes we need that skin contact with the cameras to pick up what's going on. So this is just one idea um, of a research concept that we are currently doing in a research partnership with to look at how we can immobilize and what how effective it would be. And here we have um, a concept which is a sort of uh, arms forward uh, tray design um, that we could use for anything where we're treating sort of 
the lower abdomen into the pelvis, where the importance of the immobilization is, is in that pelvic region, which, which you get from the shin rest, the hill rest, the vat bag, the abdominal belt. So really the arm position doesn't necessarily have to be quite so strict. So you've got here, you've got this, you're maintaining the support for the patient. Um, it looks a bit more friendly, it's very comfortable, and it's still getting what we need out of it. We're still using a mobilization, but we're just adding a bit more comfort where we just need to keep hands mm. out of the way. And we have had patients ask if we could put a little iPod or <laughs> iPad little support in there so they can watch something during treatment. Coffee so. cup holder. <laughs> You've anticipated a question there, Kate. Oh. <laughs> Someone <laughs> said, could you, have, could you have like the patients watching a film on their iPhone? Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, and if you think about it for sort of younger patients as well, like um, teenagers, young adults, and potentially into paediatrics, you know, why couldn't we have something for them to look at, so to disrupt them? So that's the concept behind the upright um, patient rotation system. So now moving on to Ruby. Now this is Leo Cancer Care's um, LINAC. So this is going to be a 6MV uh, triple F, so flattening filter free uh, LINAC. As you can see, because we have that advantage of a fixed beam, we're able to hide the major components more discreetly. So it doesn't look quite so scary for patients. Now, this will actually um, move in and out slightly towards the patient, obviously, to maintain our um, FSD. It will have a multi-leaf collimator in there of 120 leaves. And as you can see here, you've got the um, cone beam um, CT capability. Now, just moving on, what you also see here is what we call a beam stop. So the advantage of having that fixed beam is that we don't need a whole room of shielding. So we only really need to shield the wall that the beam is firing at. So this is great because um, it reduces our footprint. You know, we're not pouring as much concrete, but also in terms of hopefully reliability of the machine, those intricate little parts in there, like the tungsten leaves and the MLC, are not vibrating as a traditional superangantry would move around a patient so that's another thing is that you're not rotating the beam you're rotating the patient and you've got more stability in the technology so i've got a little video clip here um, with a bit more of the the specifications um, of the design here just to give you a little example of what it might look like in a workflow so as you can see, the platform comes up and it brings the patient to the beam line for imaging. And then that's the imaging um, for the CVCT on. And then that's the beam coming out into the shoulder ball there. And then this is your rotational element to get those angles to optimize the treatment. The rotation of the chair. Great, so another advantage of this, bearing in mind we have that fixed beam and we have that reduction in shielding. What's to say in the future in our roadmap? This is a little way down the line. This is a, a dream for me. Uh, why can't we put radiotherapy more accessibly into more outreach communities with this solution? And also our fellow diagnostic radiography colleagues also get to go out in sort of mobile units. What's to say we couldn't do that as therapeutic radiographers? But also for us in our profession, you know, cost of living, living in cities, would it make our commutes better? Would it make our cost of living better if we were a bit closer to work? Um, just things like that. So it's something else that we're also thinking about. So next, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Marie. So this is our proton therapy solution. Currently, what you're seeing here is the the patient rotation system and the upright CT scanner. So this is a ball size of 84 centimeters. We have a field of view of 62 centimeters. We can do between 80 and 140 kVs there. 
and it has a translation so you can pull the ring down itself over the patient of 160 centimeters so that combined with that solution we then have partnerships currently with Mevion and with Hitachi who as third-party vendors provide the proton source so we're responsible for the upright position and the CT and then we combine with the proton therapy uh, vendor but that's not to say that we couldn't actually involve other particles so carbon ions, uh, boron neutrons, helium. This is what is so great about this solution is it's so adaptable with so many things that we're now making more accessible, hopefully in the future for people. So what I've got here is a little workflow video of what that might look like for a proton treatment. So um, the patient comes in and we're using the hand pendant to go to that patient's personalized uh, supported position. And then the immobilization comes in. So what you're seeing now is just um, the patient set up there. And we've used the example of some of the devices that I've um, talked about already this evening. So what we then do is rotate um, the patient to the imaging position. We're now pulling down the ring to leave ready for the imaging. And what you may notice is that there's the same 15 degree backwards and forwards tilt with the CT ring. And this is so that with the backrest and the CT is in the same plane. So we always get a coplanar image. And now what you're seeing is the beam delivery with going to the set positions following on from the imaging. And then at the end, we bring the um, patient rotation system back to a safe position and the patient can then egress. So I'm now gonna hand over to Kate, who's gonna talk you through uh, the clinical case for upright radiotherapy. Okay, so I'm gonna talk you through, as Gemma said, some of the, the research that's already been done. Um, and just why upright might be the better option for some tumor sites. So the diagram here shows the area, the tumor sites that have already had research done into them and that have made that link between upright being a good option. So we're not limited to these treatment sites. Um, the, the system is accessible and useful for all treatment sites, but these are the, the areas that research has already been done. So starting with lung, um, MD Anderson did a study that looked into lung volume and respiratory motion in an upright position. So the patient on the left-hand side, so patient B there is in a supine position, patient A is in upright. And as you can see, the yellow outline shows the, the lung volume. So patient B has a smaller lung volume there than patient A. And what the, the research found was that on average, um, the lung volume was 25% larger in an upright position. And for some patients, it went up to 50% uh, to larger. Um, respiratory motion was about, um, so it was, there was a five millimeter reduction in respiratory motion in an upright position. And what that suggests really is that if we've got less respiratory motion, then we've got less tumor motion. So what we can do then is start questioning those um, treatment volumes that we have. Can we reduce those even more because we have more stability of the tumor because we've got less respiratory motion there. Um, so that's supporting the case of upright for lung cancers, but also it just really highlights to us that any patient that has shortness of breath. So um, it might be because they've got COPD, they might have another lung disease, we might be treating their lungs a particularly anxious patient, anyone that is struggles with shortness of breath, if we put them in an upright position, they've got that greater lung volume. We often say to an anxious patient, take a deep breath in, and they can actually do that in an upright position. And so that's gonna help them calm, oxygenate their body better, calm themselves down and help self-regulate those anxious feelings that they've got. So moving on to liver. So Paul, the Paul Scherer Institute, um, looked into um, what happens to the liver when we're lying down. And what they found was that the liver actually moved over a certain period of time. And this animation just highlights that for you. So I'll just show you there. 
I'm, I don't think you can hear the um, audio that goes with that. So I'm going to talk you through it. So effectively, the liver moves up to two, 20 millimeters over 35 minutes. So that, that questions that when you've got that beam on, the, the liver itself is actually drifting. And so the tumor itself is moving out of position. So you've imaged to start the treatment. And then over the course of the treatment, when the beam is actually on, there's the potential then that the tumor is actually moved out of the treatment position that you first imaged them in. And it sort of starts you to question what other organs have a similar effect. And it, it brings us back to the idea that upright is the position that our body is more natural in. That's what we spend most of our days, apart from when we go to bed at night, we're always upright. So what is happening to our organs when we, we lie down and, and how long it, are things potentially moving for? So moving over to the prostate. Prostate obviously make, takes up a, a massive portion of our, our patient group that we treat. Um, so Nick Schruder um, has done some research into the male pelvic anatomy in the upright position. So they looked into patients in an upright position, supine position, and with a full bladder and an empty bladder, just to see the comparison there. So I'll bring you to the first point here that says anterior posterior length and the bladder width is significantly larger. And what that was suggesting was that basically gravity works in our favor in an upright position. You've got the force of gravity and the weight of the organs above the prostate that actually push the prostate down into a more stable position. And that brings us on to the next point, which is the seminal vesicles are pushed down by the bladder on top of the, onto the pro, uh, prostate. So it's great for intermediate risk prostate cancers that we treat that we hope we can treat as much seminal vesicle as possible, but they're not the priority. But ideally we want to be treating them, but we don't want to increase our, uh, our treatment volume. So by within the upright position, the seminal vesicles are closer. So they're more encompassed in that, that treatment volume. Next point is the distance between the sacrum and the anterior bladder wall is significantly smaller. So that's looking at that small gap that often the small bowel falls down into. So if that gap is smaller, you're less likely to get the small bowel falling into it and less likely to get um, toxicity to that, that organ. Um, top of the penile bulb is further away from the apex of the prostate. So that's an organ that we keep an eye on when we're planning our, our dissymmetry. Um, and then the position and shape of the prostate is not impacted significantly by the bladder fill. So if we look at the image that we've got on screen, the solid dark blue line is the bladder when it was full. The dotted dark blue line is the empty bladder. And underneath that, you've got the prostate in light blue. So the solid light blue line was where the prostate was when the bladder was full. And the dotted uh, light blue line is where the prostate was when the bladder was empty. And as you can see, there's a big difference between the volume of the bladder each, in each of those examples, but the prostate doesn't really move. It, it's, it's pretty much exactly the same position for both of those um, instances. So it really questions, do we need our bladder fill protocols to be quite as strict as they are at the moment? And we, some departments don't follow that protocol, but a lot of them are still doing full bladders for treatment. And we know that it's really difficult for prostate patients to manage that bladder. You know, a five minute delay is, a really significant thing for a prostate patient. And as the, you go through the course of treatment, the bladder gets irritated, holding that full bladder is really difficult for them. And, and, and it's something that they worry about every day. Am I, is my bladder gonna be full enough today? Am I gonna get told off for not having drunk enough? And am I actually gonna be able to hold over the course of the whole treatment? And they really, it's such a, a really stressful thing for them, worrying about those things. So could we lighten that anxiety for our patients by not having to be quite as strict with our bladder fill protocols? Because this is suggesting in an upright, the prostate is gonna stay in that steady position because of gravity, because of the weight of the organs above it. So moving on to head and neck patients. Um, this is a real passion for me because I was a, a head and neck review radiographer and I know just how difficult head and neck cancer and then the treatment is for, for patients. There was a study that looked into perceived difficulty swallowing upright compared to lying down. And they found that it was six times greater perceived difficulty swallowing lying down compared to upright. And that was in healthy volunteers. So if you imagine it's already more difficult for a healthy person to lie down and swallow when you put someone in an upright. Um, so if you then throw in side effects of head and neck cancer treatment, 
it gets even harder. So if they've had surgery to the throat, they've had surgery to the tongue, the mobility isn't as good. You've got swelling from surgery or swelling from radiotherapy, which is narrowing that there. And also your gag reflex is heightened. You've got thick oral secretions as well from the treatment. All of those you're trying to manage whilst lying down. And again, it's a real anxiety for patients. Am I going to be able to to maintain that during treatment? Am I going to start to choke on it? Am I going to be able to breathe through that? So maybe upright is going to be easier for them. You know, gravity, we know that you've got airways are opened up. We know that they can swallow that little bit easier. And we're also looking into tongue position in an upright position at the moment. Is that going to help them be able to swallow those secretions down? And is it just going to be a more positive experience for them than being sort of laid down and, and put in that immobilization device? So moving over to breast, I'm going to pass this over to Gemma because I know she worked with Joe a little bit on this area. <laughs> yeah, big shout out to Joe actually on this one and to Professor Heidi Probst and to Tracy Underwood. Um, this study was actually going on um, in the UK Leo office in my first week. <laughs> um, and I'm delighted to say that um, Frontiers in Oncology have just accepted um, the paper that we've submitted. Um, it's not been published quite yet. Um, so the paper is entitled um, Upright Patient Positioning for Gantry-Free Breast Radiotherapy. Um, so uh, using feasibility tests, using a robotic chair and uh, specialised bras. So what we studied or the aim of that study was to look at um, overall body positioning, the arm position, the beam accessibility, looking at protons and photons and looking at the breast positioning and reproducibility specifically and the comfort of the participants we had. So there was a mixture of participants that took part in the study. Uh, some of them had had breast radiotherapy in a supine position and the others were healthy volunteers. So um, among the healthy volunteer cohort, uh, we looked at the impact of radiation bras. So we had um, the S4A bra, which is uh, being developed by Sheffield Hallam University and Professor Heidi Prost. And we also compared that with the CIVCO uh, radiation bra, which is FDA 510K approved. And so really the conclusion to the study was that upright body positioning for breast radiotherapy um, appears to be comfortable and feasible based on the feedback that we we had and that the radiotherapy bras were effective in reducing um, if not eliminating um, some of the inframammary um, skin folds um, that we kind of see uh, with upright radiotherapy because gravity is now acting in a different way so if I draw your attention to the photograph, you've got um, position uh, A, which was arms up with um, no bra at all. So you can see how the breast tissue naturally falls and you will get that pool of dose under the inframammary fold. But also what's to say we won't catch more ribs, lung dose, um, bits of liver, stomach, etc. And then um, photograph B is the S4A bra. And you can see nicely here how the breast tissue and the inframammary fold region is lifted. And the same in picture C with the um, Civco bra. And then also what was been a nice concept um, that we need to study a bit further actually is potentially changing the arm position. Because as we know, our patients really struggle post-surgery um, with maintaining this almost like diver's position uh, for radiotherapy. But what's to say we couldn't use the advantage of upright to move the hands behind you. Um, and you can see here, we looked at what that would look like for protons and photons. So protons traditionally would be sort of like an anterior beam that goes face on. So it's not such an issue. But again, when you think about the way we deliver it currently with tangential fields in um, photon therapy, we need to make sure we've got the beam access, but also we want to research a little bit more into what we would do with um, potentially larger breasted ladies and supporting with more immobilization, uh, but also what we do with the contralateral breast to spare exposure to radiation to that contralateral side. 
so moving on to the basically the experience of, of being in an upright position and I know when I first learned about ra upright radiotherapy the first patient group as I'm sure a lot of you have been sat there thinking oh I know a patient that would have really benefited from this this treatment position for me it was palliative patients I think we've all had that experience of a palliative patient coming down from the ward sort of nicely propped up in bed fairly comfortable and then we have to do that horrible thing as a radiographer where we ease them down five degrees at a time you know as a, as a wince each time you move the back of the bed down until they're completely flat and it's a really difficult process for them and it's awful to watch them have to go through that um so I think those patients would, would benefit as well and also there's there's just so many different patients that we're not exclusive to those that have been um highlighted in the research it's just the experience so for me I had a, a patient that I um worked with just before I left my clinical job and he he was a head and neck patient should have been radical treatment and he had a panic attack every time we laid him down and that's because he said because he was meant to have a mask uh, put on and he said it felt it reminded him of the time that he was held down and beaten up and it brought back those memories every time. So we would sit him back up and the first session took sort of a good 50 minutes and that's with lorazepam. And we just didn't manage it because he had these panic attacks every time. And when we have patients like that, you you know, you know, hold their hand, you look them in the eyes and you, you calm them down and you can see them visibly relaxed. But then when it comes time to lay them back down again, those feelings come back again. And it's not just them, it's, it's patients like, a lady having her breast treated or a gentleman having his pelvis, pelvis treated and they're lying down in that position and they're feeling vulnerable and then they can hear footsteps in the room but they don't know who's there because the person hasn't introduced themselves or they can hear an unfamiliar voice but they don't know who it is because they can't see what's going on in the room and on a on a basic biological level the concept is is that when we're lying down staring up at a ceiling and we can't see what's going on around them because we as soon as a patient turns ahead, we say, oh, lie nice and still. We can't see what's happening in front of us. We can't assess for ourselves whether there's danger, whether there's threat. So if we put people in that upright position, they can assess for themselves that, okay, I'm safe. I know where I am. I know what's happening. And they can feel, they can relax because they've assessed for themselves that they feel safe. And for me, it's about connection with our patients and I know that's why I went into to review work is because I like to be able to connect with our patients and I think this is a huge part of this system really is bringing that connection back to our patients as radiographers and as the, the patient so communication is 23 percent verbal so you've got a whole lot of other communication that our patients are missing out on because they're lying down staring up at a ceiling so bringing back that non-verbal communication, the body language, the facial expressions, the smile, just to add that connection back to our patients so we can express our empathy to our patients and we can see that distress in their eyes as well because we can see them better. And it's about conveying that warmth and reassurance and giving them that personal touch because we know eye contact is hugely beneficial in, in healthcare. We've seen the data, we've seen the research and we've had that feedback from patients. They so value that connection they can have with their doctors, their clinicians, their radiotherapists. And as I said, it's about that empowerment for patients as well. So yoga talks about this power pose, so shoulders back, open chest, where we can feel more empowered. And as I said, because they can assess for themselves the situation, they can assess that there is no danger, they, they're in a safe environment, they can reduce that anxiety for themselves and they can lose those feelings of helplessness where this treatment is happening to them. You know, they're part, they're central of the whole process. So we've had patients trial the system. So we've got a great partnership in Centre Leon Barad where patients will have their supine treatment and then they step into the, the upright system. So they've been able to assess directly for us what it feels like to go have treatment in a supine position and then sit in an upright system. So they said that 100% of patients found it comfortable to breathe in an upright position compared to 87% lying down. And as we said, that's hugely beneficial for patients having their lungs treated or whether it's just a person that feels particularly anxious or short of breath. 94% said it was easy to get out of the system compared to 60% in a supine position. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute because it's the really good thing about the system is that patients can just walk into the system for themselves and sit themselves down. And I'll touch on that. 
So 87% said they felt stable in an upright position compared to 67%. And that surprised me, to be honest, that patients feel that unstable in a supine position. But 87% said that upright, they felt stable. And I think those, those fixation points that we have on the shin and the heel really, and the abdominal belt just make them feel more secure in the system. And Centelion Barad have also been able to look into reproducibility, so interfraction and intrafraction um, movement. So they found that about, so I'm just reading the statistics of it because I've not got that off the top of my head. Um, so 90% of the left-right movement was within three millimeters. Um, 95% of ant post measurements were within three millimeters. And for in, that was for interfraction and intrafraction motion was within three millimeters for 90% of the patients over 90 minutes. So, sorry, over 20 minutes. So 20 minutes of sitting in that system and they were still within three millimeters for 90% of the patients. So it's really a system that is showing that it, it works well in reproducibility. And that's something we get asked a lot is reproducibility, stability. And at the moment, the statistics are showing that it's, it's working well. So as I said, Unfortunately, there is a, a trend within radiotherapy and healthcare of musculoskeletal disorders and injuries in amongst radiographers. And I think the Society of Radiographers did their research on this or their survey back in 2012. And even now in more modern uh, research, they're finding the same statistic has come about. About 80% of radiographers will sustain an injury. And it might be an injury that's a, a short lasting one. It may be one that is long-term adjustment to duties and at the moment healthcare healthcare professional is deemed more dangerous work than construction site work and I just find that absolutely crazy that we're in a profession where we're there to help other people and it's more dangerous for us than if we were working on a, a place that had cranes diggers and all these sorts of bits of equipment and I think the, the injuries that we get generally be focused around the necks, the wrists, the lower back, and it's from the twisting that we do. It's from sort of where we hyperextend rotating our patients because we always say, oh, don't help us, let us move you. And also because as radiographers, we don't want to see our patients struggle. So we've got if we've got someone that's struggling to get out of the, the, the system when they're lying down, we want to give them a little help because we don't want to see them struggle. And also because we're watching the clock at the same time that we we just need to move on to the next patient. So we're always aware of that. So we do the odd little bit. We're all manual handling training and all, we all know how to do things the right way. But sometimes we do those little bits that end up, if you're doing it over and over again, that it's causing injury to us as a profession. And that's the good thing about this system is that as people, we're used to sitting down and standing back up. We do it every day. We do it to sit down for dinner. We do it to watch the TV. Our bodies are used to it. Our patients are used to doing it all day, every day. Their muscles are used to that. What they're not used to doing is lying down completely flat on a narrow bed and then having to get all the way back up. They only do it at the end of the day. So our bodies are more used to sort of sitting up. And the good thing about the system is like Gemma said with the seat pan is you can actually angle it. So we can have someone in a completely 90 degree sitting position and then we can slowly change the angle. So it almost helps the system into the upright position so they can just then step out and, and walk themselves out. So there's less involvement. And, and the colleague we have over in Centrally and Barad is saying that as, a, as she's a, a therapeutic radiographer herself. And she says she finds that she just needs to step back and allow people to do it. So there's a lot less manual handling. And also like Gemma said, the, the backboard is so light that you haven't got that twisting and that weight there that we, we currently have. So that was a whistle-stop tour of upright radiotherapy. I'm, I'm hoping we cover we covered as much as possible. Yeah, I just also want to acknowledge and thank um, Sophie Bobubia at Centre Leon Bavard as well. We have a fantastic partnership with them, and she is very very passionate about this, and um, has obviously published that paper in relation to the pelvis setup reproducibility, but also for this up and coming one as well that I've spoken about that's coming up in Frontiers in Oncology. And thank you to all of you for listening as well and giving up your evening. <laughs> but do do let us know any questions that might have popped up during the session. Oh, so thank you so much. That was really interesting. And the questions were going mad. 
Okay. <laughs> Absolutely mad. So we do only have 12 minutes. So I just want to promise anyone that if your question doesn't get answered, what we will do is transcribe all the questions to Gemma and Kate and allow them to write a response. And then we will email that out to you just to ensure that everyone's question does get um, answered. So, Naman, did you want to start with the questions? Yeah, <laughs> so I've got one around sustainability. How are these machines in the sustainability side of things moving forward compared to current in the accelerators? Say that again. We couldn't quite catch that. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so is it, the question was around sustainability. So mm -hmm. how are these in the sustainability side compared to current linear accelerators? So obviously, um, I spoke a little bit about um, the LINAC proposal there with, with Ruby and how by lessening that rotation, lessens that vibration to those parts and the weight I spoke about, about the heaviness of those rotations. So we're aiming that the sustainability will be in that part of the design and the elements of the MLCs, because, you know, as Rodolfo is, it's one of the most common things that goes wrong sometimes with the MLC lives and the motors so we're aiming that you know potentially this will be a lot more reproducible um, and more reliable and um, so hopefully that would count towards sustainability. I also talked about um, our footprint as well in terms of pouring less concrete we're able to with these solutions go in and reuse what's already there uh, in the bunkers and repurpose them so we're not saying go and spend absolute millions on new centers. You know, some of us aren't in a position to do so. So let's put this technology into what we already have. Uh, most of the mechanics of the um, the patient rotation system actually sits below the hospital floor level. So it's already there. We dig a pit down into it to sit that nicely into there. And again, talking about shielding, it's we're paying for less shielding and we we don't need to pour as much concrete, create as much of that shielding. So that's some elements of it that um, we hope would really help um, with sustainability. But we still have the same sort of things as with standardly available um, things currently on the market. You know, we're still using these incredible machines. Um, so that's the same, but we're approaching it in a different way. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to pick one of the questions um, that a lot of people have asked is around the use of um, deep inspiration breath hold and also surface guided radiotherapy. So can your system be used alongside what's, what the current techniques are for some of the patient site specific areas? I'll cover the uh, deep inspiration breath hold. So we still do There's research being done on using spirometry. So we're looking at that lung volume as that that research suggested. And what they found is that because you've got that greater lung volume in an upright position, you've already got that almost inbuilt cardiac reduced cardiac toxicity because you've got that greater lung. So you can certainly use deep inspiration breath hold, but there's a question mark on whether you need it because you've already got that cardiac. Uh, reduce cardiac toxicity because you've got that greater lung volume in an upright position. And as for surface guided radiotherapy. So we we are developing our own um, optical guidance tracking system. Um, but that's not to say that we potentially couldn't collaborate in the future and have partnerships with, with other um, things currently on the market. So absolutely. And for us in the upright position, why not use that to advantage? Because Kate obviously spoke about this connection with patients and we very much believe here at Leo about giving patients control over what's happening to them. So why could we not use something like surface guided or cameras to help the patients help us get into that treatment position so we could give them something to do? Because I think sometimes patients often say to me, well, I just don't know what to do. What can I do to help? And so what we, we sort of have talked about is potentially having a camera in front of the patient with um, an image that's been taken as part of the pre-treatment session, uh, like a whitewash of themselves in the setup position, so that the patient comes in every day and they can learn to adjust themselves instead of us having to do it. But it also gives them something to do as part of being active in their treatment. So absolutely, we 
um, could use something like that and we are developing a system. Thank you. What about those patients where actually mobility is an issue or vice versa, where actually they may be too poorly to actually sit in an upright position? Have you thought about kind of solutions um, in terms of kind of adhering the equipment to those those patients? So um, I recently spent some time um, doing a bit of uh, discovery with other um, teams within Leo. Um, and we looked at um, how we would implement someone in a wheelchair onto the system. So we got the equipment, we um, we talked it through as you know clinical experts about how we would do it and uh, things like that. We, we're also working um, with occupational therapist companies um, and suppliers of some sort of mobility aids that we're reaching out to to come and share this with us, partner with us um, and bring in their knowledge to help us sort of make sure that what we're giving you guys and us as therapists um, the best like aids to be able to do this but we're focusing it on things that we would naturally see within departments that we're not we're not going to provide you with something that you've never seen and used before um, so you know things like banana boards and um, what's to say in the future we couldn't look at how we would transfer patients with other aids that we're we're familiar with already using so yeah it's definitely something that we've definitely thought about and as Kate says why not use that that seat height to help raise patients that that lack that muscle tone in their legs sometimes to just get up and going why not use that to our advantage to help them stay independent we're not pulling people around to bring them naturally up to a standing position um, but it's something that i've learned through demoing the system as well like you start talking to the to the person and then they're like oh have you finished it's like yeah absolutely you're in the right position it's it's quite it's becoming a little bit more hands off, which is is brilliant. So yeah, absolutely something we're thinking about and already starting to implement and um, join with other experts in the area. Do you then foresee that potentially it could be more accessible for patients who maybe do struggle? I'm thinking more with CT scans and um, with fitting through the ball. You know, is there a weight limit? Um, you know, it's re it can be really disconcerting for both therapists and also for patients if you have to do a trial um you know we know that that we need to be inclusive in the healthcare that we're providing so is that something that you've thought about through leo yeah i mean absolutely i mean i gave um some of the the product spec there for for the ct ring um and also you know we we still um can pride ourselves as therapeutic red offers we come up with wilds and inventive ways of positioning patients sometimes with the reproducibility and stability is still at the core of it um so we're still again um running our own workflows doing exactly that you know looking at elbows um and things like that have you got anything else to add i would just from a from a sort of ct point of view i would say it's bringing to mind a patient that i had that towards the end of treatment that was cognitively impaired he had quite advanced dementia and a ct scan in him was really challenging because he came in really comfortable in his chair, um, not a care in the world. And then we had to try and get him to lie down. And not only that, we wanted him to lie still for the length of the scan. And he just, he couldn't manage it. And even his carer said, well, he doesn't even lie down to go to bed. He just sits propped up. And so we're suddenly expecting people to lie down and stay still. Um, and he just couldn't understand that. And I think in this sort of circumstance, absolutely an upright CT scanner would be much preferred for him because he could just sit in his chair and that's all he would need to do. And he he was completely still upright. But as soon as we tried to lie him down, he just wasn't comfortable in that position and it really scared him. So I think, yes, absolutely. CT, upright CT, I think is the way to go for a, a lot of patients. And making it as accessible not just for patients that are, are limited with mobility but also their capacity and their cognition as well i think upright is potentially going to be really beneficial for for those patients as well but i think it's also important to say you know as therapeutic radio offers we constantly assess our patients fitness for treatment every day and it's part of our professional standard as well and um you know standards of practice so that's also important you know we're not 
we're still empowering us as therapeutic radiographers with those decision making processes. And again, this is where the pretreatment process is so key um, to assess someone's um, suitability for upright compared to supine, just like we do already in supine, where unfortunately there are occasions like we've mentioned that we can't treat patients or we have to go back to the drawing board or they have to go and have another therapy or intervention before they can access radiotherapy. But absolutely, we we both, you know, feel that this is absolutely the right way to go. And it's not to completely replace. There's still a place for supine. And, and often this is to work with supine treatment units because there are going to be some patients that prefer or do better in a supine position and same the other way around as well. So it's to work alongside that really more than anything. I have so many questions that I want to ask and I know the audience will be going, they've not got time to answer my question, but there are loads around use of MRI and commissioning, uh, how like the changes in planning. So we will absolutely get all of your questions, propose them all to Kate and Gemma and we'll email out the answers. So I'm sorry we don't have time to go through it today, but thank you all so much for joining us. A huge thank you to Leo Cancer Care for um, allowing us to um, help present their webinar for this evening. Please do go and check out their website and also their social media and check out, if you want to, Stephen Tao, the CEO for Leo Cancer Care, came on to Rad Chat. It's still one of my favourite episodes. So go and have a look on any of the podcast libraries um, for that episode and enjoy. We hope to welcome you for a future webinar in the in the future. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks very much for Good having night. us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye.